Okay. Uh, our first order of business this evening is to discuss uh, the Article 44, Community Preservation Committee Appropriation Recommendations. And for that, we have uh, Chair Kratzley. Mr. Kratzley, would you like to step up to the mic, to the virtual microphone? Well, here I am. Um, okay, so I was just gonna make the introduction. I'm John Kratzley, 10 Edmonds Road. Um, and uh, with us this evening is my vice chair, Tom Kearns, Heather Gill, our senior planner, who has just put the slides up, uh, which I appreciate. Uh, CPC members uh, are in the audience uh, with you and applicants are with you, as well as Mina Macarius, uh, town council. Um, so um, there are some, uh, Heather, if you want to go ahead, that's slide number one. And can we, yeah, so Article 44 um, has a, a recommendation of 1.9 million for the CPC distribution. There are 10 recommended funding grants in the Warren article. Um, I will, uh, I think in a hopefully speedy way, go through them for you. Six are for town projects, four are for community projects, 1.6 million uh, our town projects, about 300,000 are community projects. Uh, next slide. Uh, I think this is all familiar to FinCom members. We're a town of a 1.5% um, surcharge. Um, the amount of money that is available, uh, how we get to the 1.9 is a combination of our local um, surcharge and state match money from the Registry of Deeds. Uh, I think the next slide simply shows our distribution plan for this year between the statutorily required areas of uh, community housing, recreation, historic preservation, and open space. Uh, because, so I think I'd like to go to slide six if I could, um, the, and we'll pass the uh, this, yeah, and move to slide six. Because of the interest in uh, two particular proposed grants um, uh, and to accommodate town council's schedule, I'd like to start with the applications that had the most questions at our February 6th meeting. And these are the proposed grants for historic preservation um, for two religious organizations, First Parish and Concord and the Holy Family Parish. Um, and I think we should just show slide um, seven as well, which is the summary of the Holy Family uh, Rectory renovation as well. Um, when we met on February 6th, I handed out to all of you individually, well, because we could be together at that time, uh, Town Council's opinion letters approving eligibility of each project for CPC funding and stating that in his opinion, each of these two projects could survive a Kaplan or so-called Acton Court Challenge. Each proposed project um, is for historic preservation, and that's exactly as the CPC saw it. The first parish funds would repair and restore the clock tower or belfry that holds the town-owned clock, as well as the dome above it, and the necessary work on the four clock faces. The Holy Family Parish funds would replace an old roof on the uh, rectory house and do so with new historically accurate matching materials. Each of the proposed funds is in the uh, exact same number of 75,000. And at this point, I would turn to town council um, for your questions of him regarding the opinions that he offered or his own comments uh, Mina, I don't know if you have something to say right at the start or would rather take a question or two about these two, um, but certainly back in February, this, these attracted the most attention. Thank you, John. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you for accommodating my schedule and, and, and starting with these. Um, I have very little to add uh, in addition to what we said in those in that memorandum uh, that you received back in February, we've looked at both the family Holy Family Parish and the um, clock tower uh, projects. 
Mina, could I interrupt you for just one sure. second? Um, mm -hmm. In this context, you're speaking to the community. You did speak to us as a finance committee and present, and we did have those memos from you, but the community needs to hear in a separate vein. So that's, that's, uh, so don't presume that folks have heard or seen or read these memos. It, it would be better that way, I think. Okay. No, that's fine. I, I want to limit um, saying too much in the interest of time, but sure, I can yeah. quickly summar summarize the issue. So the issue um, with both these projects is that they are funding uh, private projects, which is certainly allowed under the Community Preservation Act. Lots of private projects have been funded in the past. What makes these um, of interest and, and why we were asked to look at them separately is that both of the owners of the projects are religious institutions. Uh, a few years back, the town of Acton funded a project in its historic district, um, which was a church. Um, and the, uh, the grant of funds was challenged uh, by a group of taxpayers alleging, among other things, that the funding from the CPA, uh, the Community Preservation Act funding, violated the anti-aid amendment of the Massachusetts Constitution, uh, which is intended to limit the use of public funds for private organizations, in particular, uh, private religious organizations. The anti-aid amendment has a long history. It, it has uh, its roots partially in the anti-establishment clause of the U.S. Constitution, but also in some anti-Catholic um, uh, school funding in the 1800s. So that's sort of the, the idea of it is to avoid entanglement of religious uses with public funding. Um, uh, we, we happen to represent the town of Acton, so I am very familiar with the case because my partner, Nina Pickering Cook, uh, tried the case. And the, the Supreme Judicial Court came up with the decision on it, essentially uh, kicking back parts of the, the factual findings to the town and, and setting a test for when projects are eligible for funding and when they're not. And so taking that test into account with the Holy Family Parish and the, um, the First Church uh, projects here, uh, we, we analyzed those uh, back in the fall and, and December as we, we look at every CPA project, but those two had the, the most questions. And in both cases, uh, we came out of the opinion that we believe both projects are eligible for funding, um, although certainly uh, want anyone in the community and, and, and the finance committee to be aware that um, the test set out by the Kaplan case, the Acton case, uh, is a fact-based one, uh, which makes it susceptible to somebody uh, taking a challenge of the case. We believe the town has the better of that argument, but I can't rule out that somebody would challenge um, uh, either grant of funding. Um, just taking them uh, separately, and I, I want to very quickly just mention the, the Kaplan test, without turning this into a, a law school lecture, which I'm sure no one would want, uh, is, is uh, th three factors. First, whether the purposed, uh, purpose of the um, challenged funding is to aid private um, causes, in this case, is churches, whether it does, in fact, substantially aid those churches, and finally, whether, this, uh, whether the aid avoids the political and economic abuses which prompted passage of the anti-aid amendment. Um, so as you can already imagine, those are very flexible standards. Uh, but taking each of those um, in turn um, and starting with First Church, which we think is the easier one, um, the, you, certainly in both cases, the use of CPA funds is not to aid churches or to aid religious organizations, it's to aid historic buildings. And the SJC recognized that in the Kaplan case, um, I think it's, the, it's, it's very clear the use of that funding here for First Parish, which is really a, a, a town-owned clock that happens to be in a church. This is not uncommon. There are actually several towns in Massachusetts that have, have this feature. Um, I, I know, for instance, Winchester uh, placed its clock in the in the church tower, and at the time, those were the tallest buildings in town, and where town clock tower town clocks often went was churches. So um, there's certainly no 
a purpose to aid it there. With respect to Holy Family, that factor I think also comes out in favor of, of the funding being eligible. The, the funding would be used here entirely to repair a historic roof, I believe, and, and Mr. Kratzley and others can correct me if I have the project uh, off slightly, um, but that's um, it's not intended to preserve or aid any of the religious aspects of it, uh, of the building. Um, two, whether the, whether the aid here would substantially aid the churches. Again, with the clock tower, it's the easier of the two uh, because it's a town-owned resource and, and it would be going to preserve that particular resource. Uh, we originally had questions in October in our first memorandum to the CPC whether or not they, the, the you know, to get a little bit more detail about Holy Family, but the information we got back, again, made it clear that the cost would only be going for historic preservation. Um, one of the things that SJC was worried about in Kaplan was a sort of supplanting of funds. Would it end up uh, making it easier for the church to spend money um, on operational things or, or sort of other pieces of it? And then the third factor in both of these is sort of the entanglement of church and state. Um, and the that factor was the hardest one for the SJC to deal with in Acton, partly because some of the historic features of the church in Acton included a stained glass window with certain religious um, significance to it. That's not at issue here. Um, the two things being repaired are, again, the, the clock, which has functioned as a town clock uh, for over well over a century, and the rectory, which although certainly in a roundabout way serves a religious purpose, the reason for the funding here um, is for the, histor the historic nature of it and doesn't have any particular religious features. Uh, the, the closest that it comes, I believe there may be two small crosses on some of the doors, but the, it is unlike a stained glass, which the SJC, um, to paraphrase, um, said it's, it's really hard to, to say when stained glass is just a, a beautiful architectural feature versus a religious feature. It's so enmeshed within religious um, iconography and imagery. And, and that's really the test. The other thing I would just keep in mind, um, and the SJC grappled with this as well, um, it's a little bit different uh, in the CPC is a somewhat discretionary grant program, obviously. And this, the Community Preservation Committee makes recommendations both about the eligibility of funds for use, but also the best use of limited funds among a lot of projects and a lot of requests. Um, around the same time that the SJC was grappling with the Acton case, the U.S. Supreme Court uh, was deciding a case called Trinity Lutheran out of Missouri. And one of the key findings in that case is that while uh, state and local governments certainly are entitled to be careful about establishment clause issues and, and that entanglement of church and state, they also uh, have to be careful not to treat um, otherwise non-religious aspects of funding requests from religious organizations differently. And so the in that case, it was a playground funding program the state of Missouri had set up. Um, the particular church in question had a playground and it wanted to apply for that funding. And the state government entities got squeamish about funding a, um, a church playground, the Supreme Court uh, ruled in the church's favor that they shouldn't be um, disqualified simply for being for the playground being owned by a church. And uh, the reason that's relevant here is that it really helps put a, uh, a finer point on the sort of the, the funding purpose issue. Um, in Trinity Lutheran, the, the point is what was being funded was a playground that happened to be owned by a church. In your case, and why I think both of these are eligible uh, for CPA funding, is that you have a clock tower and a historic building downtown, both of which, or excuse me, a historic building in Concord, um, that both of which are um, being funded because of their historic nature, not because they are religious and the fact that they're owned by religious entities perhaps warrants some caution on the other factors in the Kaplan test, but not an outright disqualification. So that's that's it. So, yeah. 
So can I ask you a question, please? Mr. Kratzley used the phrase withstand a challenge. These projects could withstand a challenge. Challenge. So I'm not a lawyer. Does that mean they would win a lawsuit? Um, that's right. That's that's a good way of to say that uh, I believe uh, if someone brought a lawsuit, the town and the town decided to defend it on the grounds that it was um, it was a constitutional use of funds, that the town would prevail. So my recollection from our last meeting was it was this committee's intent to avoid opening up the town to the possibility of a lawsuit. I may not remember. It was, it was a while ago. I may not recall exactly. John, I, I believe your recollection is it, you're on point there, but I, I do think that we didn't make any particular decision. It was definitely discussed that we would um, that we would be concerned that that we're opening ourselves up, and that that might be a reason to decide against. But I don't think that we had any particular. Uh, we didn't take a vote or or have a you know have a finding. I don't believe. Um, I, I'd like to ask a question, Amina. That's a little bit off the you know. It, it's not really diving into the religious aspect of this, but you know we've tapped up against this issue in the past, and that is the funding of, of uh, exterior uh, characteristics of historic properties, which are not inherently public access facilities. Um, the Wright Tavern was, was funded multiple years in a row uh, for exterior characteristics, windows, roofing, et cetera. The uh, the Mason the Masonic Lodge had foundation work done, uh, et cetera. Um, the building in question that I'm questioning is the rectory. Um, it's a religious facility, um, and you know I just don't know how open the facility is to you know the general. Well, I'll call the general public or not a non-religious purpose. Um, so that's that's just a question that's a little bit outside of whether it's a religious funding or not, and more is it a private entity that doesn't have a public component to it that's truly public? That's that's my question. Sure. So, uh, Mr. Banfield, you can tell me if, if this is going to the heart of what you're asking, but really the question is any private entity where the funding is for the exterior of the building and it's not necessarily going to be used by the public, the building itself, whether that's an appropriate use of CPA funds. And I guess my, my answer to that uh, is there's is sort of two part. There is a policy piece and whether you decide uh, whether the CPC decides to recommend it in town meeting ultimately votes it, maybe that comes into the, the balance. But from the legal side, which is what I'm limited to, uh, it's certainly a legal use of Community Preservation Act funds. And the reason there is that the Community Preservation Act is intended to do exactly what it sounds like, preserve uh, certain assets, some of which like recreational areas and um, affordable housing, for instance, can be used and are intended to be used by particular, either particular individuals for community housing or the public as a whole for recreation. Uh, some of which are just intended to be preserved because of the value of them and, and the recognition from the legislators, they might otherwise be lost. And when it comes to historic preservation, the idea is to preserve historic structures. The analog is conservation land, which CPA funds, um, CPA funds and now the charitable uh, exemption in the property tax code, both recognize um, that conservation land may be sort of untouched it's not necessarily for use by the public. It's for the value of having it there. The same can be said for uh, historic preservation. The difference is when you can actually see the historic facade, it makes a difference for the, um, the community as a whole to be able to see it from the outside. I would add to that just to be clear, because I, I don't want to be mis misunderstood as saying that the rectory is not open for public use. In fact, one of the, the factors that I think is helping avoid some of the religious use issues with the Holy Family Rectory is that they do, in fact, make it open for use by a variety of groups, uh, not not solely um, church groups. Um, and so 
I guess the short answer, Mr. Banfield, is as long as a historic preservation is, is, is preserving a recognized historic resource, it's not relevant that um, it might not be open to all of the public, um, especially when you're talking about historical facades. And in, if, it was, if the money was being used for the interior, I would agree with you. I, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm sort of okay with that um, to, a, to, a, to a point. Um, I'd like to see the public access be non-discriminatory, um, and I have some concerns about the Catholic Church having their own agenda, but that's one item. But the other item that I am concerned about is that by stretching this, we have a, we have a lovely uh, drive down, uh, down Lexington Road, and there are numerous homes which are privately held, which, which contribute to the historic nature of that road. Um, not the least of which is the grapevine cottage in which, you know, the Concord grape was first, you know, uh, created or not created, but, you know, found. Um, can these private individuals petition uh, legitimately for this money? Uh, are, we, are, we setting a, are we setting ourselves on a path that means that we have a very broad view of what a public facade or historic preservation would be. Uh, Dean, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Yeah, um, I just wanted to respond on the question of the Holy Family um, public use because I'm looking at the supplemental um, application um, that uh, town council referred to. And there's a, a a list at the bottom of the first page of about six or seven different organizations that utilize the space in that building, as well as a reference that when, uh, after the roof is done with other non-CPC money, there will be enhanced space for more public meetings and more public groups um, in, in that building because they do contemplate a bigger project. Um, although the roof funding is the only issue they came to CPC for. And, and with respect to, yeah, I just and, like one and, more thing. And, yeah. and to say that, that, you know, here's a list of public entities that are not of a religious nature that we have in our facility. Um, you know, I just, I don't want to get too divisive, but there would be some entities where they would just say, no, we don't agree with that. And I'm just going to leave it at that. Um, so, you know, I wanted to respond to John Hinckley as well on the issue of um, the risk of litigation or the fear of litigation, and because I did hear that mentioned at the February 6th meeting. And I want to make clear that the CPC view is that these are worthwhile historic preservation projects that went through a very thorough uh, review, site visits, applicant interviews, public hearings, town council, several town council opinion letters, and, and a final vote. So it, it's our view um, that the fear of litigation or the risk of litigation is really not a, a right or legitimate test going forward for even for you folks. I know you have a long-term responsibility for the town budget and the town litigation budget, and I know there are litigations in process that are on people's minds right now, but we would ask that this work, uh, very carefully done, go forward to town meeting um, on the merits. Thanks. Can I ask I a just have a, a, go ahead. Who's going? Um, Mary, how about Mary? Yeah, I have a quick question. So John, if, if in fact someone did mount a, 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 a case against this, um, I know that we, find, we feel that we would prevail, but we would still incur legal expenses. So can you tell me, would those legal expenses be paid by the town or would they come out of the CPC funding? I assume now. Now Nina may have a, a, a more historically consistent answer, but I would assume they would be um, out of the town litigation budget because the CPC funding has already been allocated. No, should the warrant prevail and go through town meeting, as brought to you this evening, um, that money would all be appropriated to the ten different applicants. There's a small amount in item number ten for administration. And I, we we, right. we we could we could debate down the road whether some of that money could be de, could be. No, used I, for I understand. No, no, I'm I'm more interested in do, will will the CPC eventually get cross charged for the 
for the exposure to the uh, to the fact that we might have to pay to defend these decisions? That's my question. Yeah, I'm not part of any other town agency or town board that ever has. Okay. Is Kerry, has to carry its own head Kerry, to carry its Kerry, own Kerry, litigation costs. Kerry, Kerry, do you know if that do we cross charge at all or? We do in limited circumstances. Okay. Any other questions from the finance committee regarding? Well, we've only we've only looked at two of the slate of CPC things. Carl, you have your hand up. Well, yeah, uh, it's not a legal question; it's an architectural question. A few years ago, when the uh, slate roof on the uh, brick building was going to be replaced, and uh, they sought a that was the town of town building sought a CPC grant. Um, and they were refused. Um, and the expected outcome, I'm not sure what the actual outcome, I would have to go back and check, but was that the slate roof then would not be replaced and they would be using asphalt shingles. Now, these Ludovici uh, tiles are a premium roof, very, very nice roof. But is there a chance that if they don't get funded, they would replace them with, uh, you know, asphalt shingles. I am not aware whether uh, the applicant is on this Zoom with us to answer that question. I know that when they revised their application, as you heard from town council, they were very specific about the desired historically accurate uh, tiles, and they limited their application to exactly uh, that approach for their roof. Uh, Mr. Chair, if I Heather, could, I, I... Yeah, Heather, Heather may have an answer on this. Yeah, they're also located within the historic district. Um, so they currently have a certificate of appropriateness from the historic district's commission to replace the roof in kind, which is the existing material on the roof. Um, so if they were to replace it with any other sort of material, they would need to submit an application to the Historic Districts Commission, um, and it would be up to them what type of material they would approve. Uh, Dee. Yeah, um, a couple comments and then a question. Um, Carl, I remember that case coming before the CPC when I was on the CPC, and it was the, the cost difference between a slate roof and the asphalt on the Kai's Road building was just very, very high, and so that was part of the the um, part of the discussion. Um, in terms of um, a religious or a, a religious structure, you know, anybody at town meeting can can suggest or um, make a make a. Um, motion to eliminate a project from the list of projects. So that's out there as long as you have a second and you can vote on it at town meeting. Um, so that's the other comment. My question, John, to you is, can you please refresh my memory on what, um, what percentage did you use for your state match? I or maybe that, Heather knows. I bet Heather knows the answer. Not off the top of my head, I can check. Okay, because um, I know that originally um, it had gone up. What what the what the thought was in the early well late winter was that it was going to be about nineteen percent, but there was an email that was sent out that I received today from the CPA that said that based on what has happened with the taxes and tax collections and the um, deeds, um, where the money comes, when the revenue comes for the use of the CPA, that they are now saying that the state match is 11.2%. I believe that's for next year. It's for next year. That all that whole Isn't that what we're talking about? No, no, like the funding we would have available to, to allocate for next year's applications. For, for next year's application. Correct. Okay. I, I do think it would be um, good if you checked on that. 
Yeah, I just want to make sure I asked today. that question. I was just surprised that this would come out today if it didn't have some impact in terms of the funding for this, you know, for what people are looking at for um, voting on for next year's budget. D, right after I saw this same memo that you referring to, I sent an email asking that same question, but I read this to refer to next year when the Department of Revenue formula has been completely changed by the legislature. Okay, yeah. so says, we're all set. We don't have any issue with whatever state match percent you use. We do not believe so. From okay. Everything we've been able to learn. Great. Thank you, John and Heather. Do we have any more questions on the first two items? Oh, Andrea, what would you like to say? I, I just have a question about um, the groups that you listed, or there is a list of groups that use um, use the facility. Um, and I assume there is um, there's a charge for the rental uh, by each of the groups. And is there a portion of that rental if if it is rented um, that goes that would go towards any part of this project? Does anybody know? <laughs> The statement provided in the supplemental application that we referred to earlier says there is not a requirement, uh, uh, no, there's no religious practice requirement in giving any organization or agency free use of our space. Whether, so that would say that there's no fees involved. Um, we do not really know for the rest of their renovation project um, in, in the, the separate work they want to do apart from the roof, um, the source of that funding, but they have indicated that they have uh, a, their own source of funding for other aspects than the roof. But it doesn't sound like from this supplemental that anybody pays to use um, the list includes the Boy Scouts, the Rotary, the Lions, uh, Open Table. Um, it doesn't sound, alcohol, AA, it doesn't sound like they charge them anything. The way they wrote the application. I have I have a question. Are those are those organizations using the build that building, or are they using other properties that are in that group of buildings? Is it is it more other like the church or the monument hall, or is it that particular building? I know no. the Rotary has used uh, monument hall, right. uh, not it's, monument hall. The um, the building next to it. So is it the building that is being re-roofed? I believe so. It says the agencies and organizations make use of our space are, 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 lim are, are include but not limited to, and there's about 10 because it goes over to the second page, and then they speak of how their project enhances community meetings. So, Mary, that building was the rectory. That's where the priests lived. That's right. Once the um, once we went into a collaborative, so I'm a member of that parish. So once we, we became a collaborative with uh, the Carlisle Church, the priests have now moved out of the rectory in Concord to the Carlisle Rectory. Right. So that's why the building is being repurposed. So I imagine, so they're creating office space in that building that was the home of the priests. So I understand. I understand. Go ahead. Sorry. So I, I understand say, that, so I but, it, but I'm not I sure. That whatever, whatever space they have, it's probably prospective to say maybe if somebody met in the hall before, but they will have space now in that building. I think the top floor, they're going to allow, there's going to be meeting rooms that could be used by others. So it, it may be prospective. Yeah. Thank you. Just to add to that, I believe they currently use you know, the three buildings are the other two currently for meetings, but with this renovation project, this will have um, handicapped accessible meeting spaces, which there are other properties I don't believe offer. Okay, good. Okay, I, I'd like to see if we can open up these two items since we're on them and it's fresh in everyone's mind to the public for questions or comments. So we have a group of 28 attendees 
If you would like to uh, offer a comment or ask a question, uh, you have an option on your screen to either raise your hand or type a question into the Q&A box. So um, that's, those are the two ways in which the public may participate. Are there, any, are there any people who would like to raise their hand or type a question into the, uh, um, into the question box? So I'm not gonna hold this open for too long. We do wanna move along. I don't see anything, um, anybody uh, wishing to raise a question about these. So we'll still have uh, plenty of time for public comment and questioning at the end of the presentation. So John, why don't you move forward with the rest of the slate of proposed projects? CPA. Yeah, Chair, there, I, there is one additional. Um, yeah, there is one additional historic preservation project, and Heather, that's slide six. I'm sorry, slide eight. And that's the Butter Gardens hardscape rehabilitation. Um, this is a. They sought a uh, hundred thousand. We recommended a hundred thousand. This is for the Friends of Minuteman National Park. Um, it's a, a nonprofit organization, and uh, you can see from the pictures the rather uh, shoddy condition of the walkways outside the Buttrick home. Uh, I believe that uh, this is designed with the uh, upcoming uh, celebrations in 2025 <clears throat> to increase the appearance and safety of the Buttrick Mansion grounds, the Buttrick House grounds. So I this did not draw questions on February 6th that I recall, but I'm happy to take them. And I, um, Nancy Nelson may be among the group uh, able with us tonight to answer any questions. She's being a member of the CPC. John, I think it might be easiest if we just go through the rest of the slides and all the projects and then save okay. questions till the end. Uh, Mina? I just want to check, Mr. Kratzley, Town Council. what you need me for any of the other projects. Uh, I'm happy to stick around, but it doesn't sound like it. So uh, I appreciate the time. Uh, I will say just really quickly, Mr. Banfield, to your question about private parties generally. Any private party that gets CPA funding is uh, required to give a, uh, an agreement back to the town that that funding will be protected in perpetuity. So that is one of the limitations on private funding. But so if the facade of a private home were to be fixed up with this funding, there would be an agreement in place that that facade would be retained as it was. You know, if it was even eligible, yeah. yeah. One thing I wanted to confirm, which I haven't been able to on, during the call, is whether entities other than... Um, nonprofits and institutions could even apply, but assuming they could, they still would have to grant a property interest back, a historic preservation restriction back. So thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, I, I appreciate town council joining us and I understand about his, some of his other obligations tonight that are very professional, <laughs> <laughs> like other towns. <laughs> yep. Okay. I have to make the long commute to Lexington. Now. Okay. <laughs> uh, let me let me continue um, because uh, we'll go right to the start. Slide uh, four is the uh, Commonwealth Avenue uh, home construction project. It's a three hundred thousand dollar funding of a new home in a slight land that came out of the Giro purchase. Um, as many of you will recall, there was a very strong interest in whether affordable housing could uh, result from the, the Giro land purchase. And this was really the best solution. Um, after the Giro home was torn down, this piece of land, it's um, on Commonwealth Avenue um, with utility hookups um, was selected. The, the design is done. The Concord Housing Authority uh, is sponsoring the project. They may have, uh, and I hope they have tonight, because I can't tell who all is in the audience. I'm hoping they have someone that may answer, be able to answer questions you might have about this. But this is a solution to a, an, a, 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 an affordable housing concern that's been on, I think, the, the mind of many uh, in planning for this town for some years now, once Jero uh, 
became a, t a town property. And I don't believe this had questions in February 6th either. The uh, regional housing services, uh, housing, regional housing services program um, is something that we have annually funded through CPC. Um, we are one of a group of towns, seven towns uh, that are in the regional housing services program. Um, almost all the towns pay similar or more. Um, we've been a member since 2011, and they provide a range of services in uh, determining uh, our eligibility um, uh, for meeting the, the proper numbers of affordable homes. Um, Heather may want to say a bit more because she's more familiar with it, exactly the functions of this, of, of this grant. I think if there's specific questions, we can come back to it. Okay. That covers um, that covers the grants for affordable housing. There are three projects for open space and recreation. The Giroux Park Improvements Phase One is a project um, that calls for the construction. You can see a little picture of it: a construction of a composting toilet facility and trails very close by to the new toilet facility and close by to the Bruce Freeman rail trail and the parking lot for which, uh, which is already uh, underway, uh, if not finished at the Bruce Freeman rail trail. And some of you may have even used it at this point. Um, so this is the first part, that's why it's called phase one, the first part <laughs> of improvements at the Giro land, but it's located up on the ridge line. It, it doesn't begin to spend money on the lower part of Giro land down toward the water, but it's designed to uh, put in a toilet facility and uh, walking paths at the most anticipated use area of, of the new Giro uh, park. The uh, And this does anticipate a, a contribution from the capital budget of 600,000 with CPC funding of 500,000. Uh, the next uh, recreation is the Warner Pond dredging project, uh, which is a long term. I know the question came up at the February 6th meeting about uh, banking money or spending money within a given year. In this case, this would be banked for the long term improvement of the water quality in the pond. Um, it's a $500,000 CPC funding um, that will permit uh, selected targeted areas. If you talk with, with Delia Kay about the future plans, there's selected target areas of uh, clearing and dredging uh, in the pond area for better potential swimming and public use. I do believe some of this money will be spent in the first year for a boat launch uh, at the end of the Commonwealth Avenue Street, as well as some parking places at the Commonwealth Avenue um, entry to, to, to the pond. The third is the Assabet River Pedestrian Bridge. Um, this is uh, an still the planning stages. This would uh, get the uh, allow to uh, do construction drawings and documents. It would allow for uh, future grants to be sought, future private funding to be sought from the commercial areas that would benefit uh, from the construction of this bridge. Um, there is now a desired location for it, uh, very much adjacent to the railroad, uh, the railroad bridge. And this is recommended at 250,000 um, and if Marsha is on the, or, or Heather, they may be able to answer people's questions about, about um, the value of this, of this going forward. I, I'm here. Um, can anybody hear me? Yes. Yep. Hi, this is uh, Kate Hodges, Deputy Town Manager. Is, is Marsha on the call as well? I'm looking. So, Kate. She is. Let me, uh, let me, let me uh, make her. Marsha, you can speak if you'd like. And Kate may want 
want yes. to speak about the uh, Giro and, and the and the dredging. Yeah, I was hoping just to um, provide a, a little bit of a change um, because the CPC application um, only speaks to the bathroom and the pathways up there, but the, the total project will in fact have um, quite a bit of renovation of the lower part closer to the water. So um, although it isn't part of the application that we put in this year, um, it is part of last year's application and um, last year's uh, capital funding that we have. And if you give me a moment to share my screen, I can show you the rendition that's going to be going to um, going to the Conservation Commission for our notice of intent, which we've filed. I don't know. Are you able to see yep. that relatively yep. well? So this is the um, facility that um, we put in the application for this right here is the composting toilet this is actually a post and beam um, barn like structure it's a three season um, there'll be no heat um, yes there will be electricity um, really sort of an open air type of pavilion type of concept and that um, is being paid for through the recreation revolving fund they're hoping to um, spend money to do a, a post and beam there with our facilities team uh, putting that in place. The remainder of um, the funds uh, that we asked CPC for include these connections here that come up here for the roadway, or actually their um, asphalt paving up for ADA ac accessibility. This turnaround that's here um, and the ability uh, to have sort of a little type of patio thing with a more of a hardscape here with some benches, and then the connections here uh, and here to the Bruce Freeman Rail Trail, and then the connection out here to a more wooded um, section. There, this is more of the property, but we're not developing this. That'll just be uh, woodlands. And then um, money that we secured last year um, and were successful also with CPC and through, um, uh, through our capital planning includes this driveway here. Um, and then, of course, this is the site for the affordable home. And, and all of these connections here, the walking paths, these are um, hardscape and these are more natural stone dust paths. And then um, depending on what we have left as far as funding, um, which is also dependent on our capital improvement plan, we have a, a ADA system here for the dock that comes down um, and then connects to a, a small ADA um, accessible uh, kayak launch here um, and a fishing pier out here that hopefully comes up right to the water's edge. But that um, that might very possibly be a future phase. And we're going to be bidding it um, as, a, as an ad alternate because we're not sure what the other um, things will come into. But effectively, everything that you see here on this plan, with the exception of this small piece right here, will be um, what we're able to accomplish. Uh, and we, barring any unforeseen circumstances, would like to start going to bid even if town meeting is pushed until September um, to split it up into phase 1A and B so that we can um, at least capitalize a little bit on the fall construction season. Thank you. Thank you. Is Marsha on the line? On the call on the Zoom? Yes. <laughs> yes, I'm here. Did you want to speak about the bridge? Um, just that we've had some preliminary conversations with Mass DOT, and uh, we are working to see if they would help with the funding for construction. Um, again, the town would have to come up with the design, and so that's what these funds would be uh, put toward. But if we can work out some agreements with um, uh, the new owner of 300 Baker Ave to uh, create a pedestrian path from uh, where the bridge outlets onto their property over to Baker Ave, then uh, it would be eligible for state funding for construction. Thank you. We do have a few more left on the presentation. Yeah, why don't we let the 
uh, them finish with their slate and we can hold our questions till the end. Thank you, Mr. Chair. There are two remaining. The uh, slide number 14 is the uh, application of Minuteman Arc for an outdoor oas oasis recreation park. I think we just lost slide 14. There it is. Um, you may recognize uh, the space alongside the Minuteman Arc um, building. It's currently open, but this is what they propose in the picture to put into that space, um, a range of opportunities for disabled to have outdoor um, movement, outdoor space, um, outdoor d dining, outdoor picnicking. Um, this was a uh, hundred thousand. It'll be matched with um, much of their own money. It meets the needs of the special needs community, um, and it is going to be open to the public. The last item in our application is the staff and technical support, um, which supports the work of our senior planner, um, Heather Heather Gill. Um, she has, and we currently have a good number. Um, I think she gave me recently over 30 open projects. Um, may, some come up for closing. All that takes time and energy, um, um, as well as the, the dues that we owe to the state organization um, and uh, the signs that you see all over town. So this seems an appropriate expense to keep our work going. That completes our, our 10 uh, proposed projects in our Warren Article 44. Okay, so now we have time for some finance committee questions and then we'll try to open up to the public as well. D. Hi, um, I think this is probably best directed to Kate. Kate, if I understand correctly, between Article 11 and uh, the CPC um, article, that $2.1 million will go to both the Giro property and Warner's Pond dredging project. And my question to you is, um, how much will, are you over time and in the, within the next five years anticipating your cost to be? In addition to this $2.1 million this year. Uh, for the, I'm sorry, my costs or our costs for the Giro property or relative to the dredging or both? It's both. Okay. I, I'm going to defer, I think, to Marsha on the dredging concept because that's actually a conservation um, commission uh, initiative. What I can tell you is that the feasibility study um, that was done by ESS quite a while ago, you know, kind of went through the whole watershed plan. And what is being done now are just the two spots that get sort of that either the high the highest and best use right now, which is the right. current boat launch, and then the area where we're hoping that people would canoe out of. Correct. When we were when we were going to purchase the Giro property, there was a great deal of um, community desire um, to uh, engage in swimming activities in the pond. Uh, evidently, some number of years ago, lots of people have fond memories of having swimming lessons or whatnot in the pond. And um, if you recall, around the time we were doing that, we also were told by the White Pond Associates that we were going to be gifted White Pond. And so my thought was that having White Pond available for public swimming might reduce people's desire to swim at the Giro Pond. And so it would just really be for, you know, non-motorized water sports and not waiting. Um, so there isn't any plans in the future to dredge anything relative to making a swimming area, but okay. I, I don't know whether that that desire will, will resurge. I, I can't know. Um, so that sort of, uh, that is a very expensive proposition. Um, and I frankly don't believe that we would get um, as much bang for our buck, uh, honestly, with since we have, you know, White Pond right close. So, you know, but again, I, I think it's up to the community. As far as um, Giro is concerned, we have uh, the money that we received last year uh, from CPC, which was um, $200,000. And then we had additional um, $500,000 
from last year's capital improvement. And so we believe, um, unless something uh, has gone uh, really awry in the, in the near future, that we'll be able to get about $1.75 million worth of the project, which is why I showed you that new um, uh, sort of artistic rendition. We believe, um, as it is right now, that everything that's seen on there, including the smaller kayak launch, will be doable. Now, we'll see when we go out to bid. This um, The COVID situation has been difficult because a lot of the smaller companies, and we have a couple of companies that had bid on um, some work, both at White Pond and at ride out in the past had given us very advantageous pricing because they were local and, and wanted to do it. And I'm not sure those companies were able to um, not have to furlough employees. So I don't know how that's going to go. Mm -hmm. um, the consultants are saying that they're seeing that uh, other projects that they've done in neighboring communities have come in under what they thought the budget was. And if that's the case, we would be done. What I can tell you is that um, we're looking to leave Jiro with the picture that you see once it's done as is for a bit until we hear what, if anything, people would like. Um, a you. lot of people have said they want a, a gazebo, but we're, we're pretty sure that the little barn area will serve that purpose better. And frankly, we're trying to minimize the amount of things that we put on that hill crest because it, it just ruins the ability to drive into the pond and, or, you know, into the parking lot and see the beautiful pond. We've heard okay. some folks would like uh, a playground. We think we have one right down the road at ride out. So that might be repetitive. So, you know, we're not planning on the town side to propose anything, but it doesn't mean that the community wouldn't, you know, propose something to the rec commission that may or may not get traction. Thank you. Uh, Mary. Mary. I have, a, I have a question. Um, so, Kate, I read a lot of the feedback that you got through your surveys for what people wanted from the Juro, and I thought, first of all, that was very, very thorough. Um, what I read was I thought people wanted a lot of open space and trails, yes. um, as opposed to a lot of hardscape and, and uh, things like that. But um, I have a follow-up question. Did I hear you say that um, the money for the dock would come out of the money for the dredging? Oh, no, no, no. We think that we have enough money under the capital plan based on the fact that pricing is coming in advantageous, that we would be able to have enough with the money providing, the provi right, the, providing that our capital plan for this year passes and this article passes. We believe we'd have enough to be able to do something small in a, in a kayak launch there. Um, but uh, so, so would that be coming out of the money earmarked for the dredging, the half a million for the dredging? Or no. The, it would be money from the Juro. From the capital, from got the it. capital article. Yep. Okay, got it. Thank you. Any further questions? I, I just want to see, Marsha, did I represent the, the dredging adequately or is there something that I missed? Well, the half million is is the beginning. Um, there, there, we will be back for additional funding. Um, I believe that the estimates had been about three million to do this small portion that we are anticipating dredging. And I can't remember if it was six acres or nine acres out of the fifty-two acre pond. It was nine. Okay. Yeah. Um, but we are not planning to come back again for any additional. So it's the nine acres out of 52 and that is anticipated to increase the the life the ability to use the pond for recreational purposes such as boating kayaking fishing um and and maybe even ice skating for another 50 to 100 years depending on how much con construction activity goes on upstream and the amount of siltation so um that's this is just a one year, uh, the first year of um, possibly one or two into the future. Thank you, Marsha. I just wanted to um, just let folks know when you go over to the Jiro uh, Park or parcel area, um, at least last year during the months of uh, July and August and early September, you were unable to actually pass through with a kayak um, because most of the things that are that are coming up and growing. So it really is sort of a necessary thing. Uh, and it was necessary before even the 
acquisition of the Giro property came about. I know that Marsha and Delia had been working on this for years. Um, and I just think, you know, while they, they both complement each other, great. It, it is a, on a, as a standalone, a really, really important project. Okay. Um, I, oh, Wade, you have a, com a question? So, so Marsha, am I to understand that there's $2 million, $2 million more dollars of future request? I don't know if it'll be two million. I know that the town has uh, set aside funds for this in its capital improvement projects, and I don't have the numbers right in front of me, so I'm sorry. But I, uh, it depends on how much funding is recommended by the Community Preservation Committee in future years. I believe we are trying to uh, get a total of 1.5 million from CPC funds and 1.5 from the town um, and but I don't have the numbers right in front of me. And the five hundred thousand dollars this year is applied to that one point five million. So it's still a mil million dollars of CPC money that we're we're counting on. Yes, and we'll match it with a million dollars, at least. Yes. Okay. Any more questions from the FinCom? Uh, sorry, it's five hundred thousand for fiscal year twenty one that was proposed, and one point five million for next year from capital. Right. Um, right. So whether that's supplemented with CPC funds or not, that is what um, Article Eleven will have in its text. Can I ask one more question? Is, yeah, is one more? We got to get to the one more. Okay. Is there a big cost differential for dredging for invasives versus dredging for boating? No. Okay. Okay. So I have um, I have two questions that have come up on the chat, um, and I can just why don't I just recognize these folks to just speak, and maybe we can do it that way rather than have me reading the chat the chat uh, questions. So I'm going to recognize Dory Keo. Um, which, which, what can I do? Can I allow you? There you go. Okay, Dory, you can weigh in. Yeah, thanks very much. Can you hear me? Yes. No. Um, when the whole uh, proposition of Giro land was proposed a number of years ago, it was with the clear statement and made by a, a member, a still member of the select board, this will be a wonderful place for the people of West Concord to swim, period. It is now morphed into something other than just a place to swim. But of course, that was never possible to swim at White Pond, I mean, at Warner's Pond at the time because it's, it's not deep enough. We sk skate there and you can see it'd be very easy to fall in because there's no bottom. I mean, because the bottom. <laughs> so I'm concerned about where is this leading? This is not what was anticipated. This is not what people voted on. When people voted on this, they had no idea that White Pond was even a dream in the town's future. And so where is the end to this? In a time when I hope we're being careful and thinking about especially today, not even just when we voted, but in, in the time when towns are going to have to be looking carefully, really concerned that we're heading down a path that was never ever anticipated. I, I'm concerned, thank you. Would you like me to respond to that? No, not necessarily, if, if Dean wants you to. No, I. I um, I don't know that 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 was more of a comment, um, Kate. I don't know that it needs to be. I don't need to know that it needs to be responded to. It's more of a comment. Um, we have one other comment here from uh, Matt Johnson. Matt, would you like to uh, just uh, talk to us? I'm going to let you. Uh, I'm going to let you in. And there you go. Hello. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. So my comment is. Oh, can't hear him. Uh, what happened? Hold on. He's muted. The, the host just muted me. Okay. I, I, I intended to knock Dory out. I must have clicked the wrong button. It's All right. right. Anyway. Sorry. <laughs> uh, considering the near and long-term budgetary impact of the pandemic, we're going to have to make some tough. Oops. This is a town. So is there any benefit of doing some of the proposed CPA projects this year in order to save CPA funds for high priority projects next year when the property tax receipts and, store and state matching funds will be reduced? 
That's especially the case if some of the related town capital funding for a project is likely to be deferred as well to save in this next year. So that's a question, I guess, for the CPC, but also for the Finance Committee. Uh, uh, excuse me. I'll, I'll yield let's, the floor. Start, let's start with the CPC. It's their, to hear it's it's their funding proposals. So let's let them comment first, and then maybe if the Finance Committee wants to weigh in on that question, I'll open it to the Finance Committee. Yeah, I have not heard from any member of the CPC uh, a sentiment to change or, or adjust um, the recommendations in Article 44. Um, it seems that we would, our, our, I think, I don't know that I can speak for, I, I certainly don't feel that I can speak for all of the members, except that there has been a, a consistent uniformity in bringing Article 44 forward, knowing that those funds um, are available and are actually needed by the applicants at this particular time. So it seems to me that that would have to go on the, either, it, we would obviously be listening to advice from the Finance Committee, um, that would go to town meeting as well as the floor of town meeting regarding any changes in the allocations at the present time. That would be my opinion. So to to just lead off as a finance committee meeting, as a finance committee comment, um, we are going to have to grapple with the set of uh, capital articles which were presented at the previous uh, uh, hearing. And then we're going to have to do these things are sort of interlocked. And I, my presumption is, and we have not, we, we started down that road prior to this hearing, um, but we have a lot of work to do to get our recommendations aligned. And so it is likely that what we will do as a finance committee before we recommend is sort of work with these things in the way that they're being presented to the town. And that is as linked uh, uh, applications for funds. And if we were to recommend an affirmative action on, say, a capital component, it is highly likely we would also suggest that, uh, that the same capital piece would be recommended for affirmative action within the CPC and vice versa. Um, but I think that as a committee, uh, it will be on us to sort of wrestle with these, these things which are dovetailed between town capital requests and and this funding and the CPC funding um, is and I'll, now I'll open up the finance committee for future for further comment. I'll, I'll make a comment. Um, I think yeah. the CPC, I think the CPC funding for FY 21 is still pretty secure because I think that the, um, the money, the matching money from the state is coming in on future money is questionable, but I think the money for FY 21, if I read the memo correctly, that, that D referred to, or earlier, I think we're not vulnerable there. And I think the money that the CPC will get from the surcharge is okay because that's based on last year's um, tax revenues. It's the future years for CPC that we have to worry about. That's my understanding. The town side, the town capital plant side, the, that's a whole other story. And that's something that we will have to be talking about um, later when, we, when the finance committee uh, puts its attention on what we recommend for this particular article. And I think that's going to be a different conversation. That's that's just what I'm thinking now. Any further finance committee uh, comments? Okay. Well, I think we've we've come to a conclusion. The uh, I don't see any any current outstanding questions from or people trying to raise their hand from the audience. So uh, I am going to. Say, John, thank you for your presentation, and we're going to move on to our next agenda item. Mr. Chairman, let me just thank all the members of the FinCom, um, as well as my own committee members who attended, as well as the applicants who attended, as well as um, Heather, our senior planner in town council. I appreciate the opportunity to present um, what has been a very uh, long year, uh, reaching a set of, I think, very thoughtful proposals that by and large, what, what over three quarters of that money benefits the town. Okay.